teacher in Queens. Attended the Yale Divinity School, although on account of his color, he couldn't be part of the formal program. Returned to his former Queens neighborhood to become senior pastor, then became senior pastor at Talbot Street Church in Hartford, and then returned as senior pastor at Shiloh Presbyterian Church on Prince Street, the largest black church in New York City at that time. And throughout his career, James Pennington was prominent and outspoken in his absolute faith that God, Jesus Christ in the Bible, would lead to freedom for all slaves. Other abolitionists denigrated religion. James saw Christ as the light that would lead to freedom. Other abolitionists advocated black immigration to Haiti, Jamaica, and Africa. James was American to the backbone, calling on his country to live up to its founding principles, equality for every person. People criticized Lincoln as not perfect. James called Lincoln the best friend the Negro ever had in the White House. I believe James Pennington deserves much more respect as a Presbyterian leader, a leader here in New York City, a great abolitionist, and a great American. And that's why I'm really pleased to be reading from this biography today. The passage I'm about to read is a speech by James Pennington, made late in life, summarizing some of his themes. Now, one bit of information you need to understand. It. The British freed the slaves in Jamaica in 1838, a country that was 90% black. And contrary to Southern slaveholder predictions, emancipation occurred in that country without bloodshed, black or white. And the new government, which was all black, proceeded in an orderly, sensible way. And now from James Pennington. The abolitionists in England insisted that emancipation was a moral question. And when a question is placed squarely on moral grounds, even in the most corrupt ages of the world, it will seldom fail to be decided according to its true character. In Jesus' parable, the mustard seed, the smallest of all seeds, which even if sown in tears, will in time become a tree where the birds of the air may have a jubilee in its branches, while the careworn prisoner may shade himself beneath it. The British condemned slavery in all its length and its breadth, in its total character, they pushed their argument to the throne, and they spoke in thunder tones to Parliament, declaring that the enslavement of man was a monstrous crime, which endangers the very existence of a nation by exposing it to the wrath of heaven. Freedom is the slave's birthright, that the only way to do them justice is to set them free immediately and unconditionally. The slave's ignorance, which has been entailed upon him by slavery, is no argument for delaying his emancipation. Whatever preparation he may need for freedom cannot be made while in the state of slavery. Moreover, as the best way to fit in a man for slavery is to place him in a state of slavery, so the best way to fit in a man for freedom is to lay upon him the responsibility of acting the part of the freeman. The stubborn advocates would like to know what we mean by immediate emancipation. We ask them to read this chapter in Jamaican history. Now we're going to refer to the emancipation in Jamaica in 1838. If he talks of bloodshed and murder, we would ask him to read this chapter and tell him how much blood he finds in it. Nay, did this event blot out the blood which had stained the land before? Murder or homicide may have been the result of slavery, but never of emancipation. Does he talk about the slaves not being capable of taking care of themselves? We only ask him to review and study this chapter and see how much pauperism it has inflicted upon Great Britain. We can but rejoice in the happy result of this benevolent achievement, and that it therefore presents the best argument why it should take place in our land. And here is an eternal truth that is destined to bear away every refuge of lies that could be bought by the ingenuity of critics, tyrants, and cavaliers to support slavery. 
When you've made a man a slave by a sevenfold process of selling, bartering, and chaining, and garnishing him with that rough and bloody brush, the cart whip, and set him to the full by blowing into the eyes of his mind cloud after cloud of moral darkness, his own immortality still remains. Subtract from it what you can. Immortality still remains. And this is a weapon in the bosom of the slave, which is more terrible and terrifying to the slaveholder than the thunder of triumphal artillery in the ears of a retreating army. They say that however desirable it may be that slavery should be abolished, it cannot be done. It is impossible. So said the British slaveholder. We lay down as a general truth that what is desirable with God is possible unto us with his aid. Upon this basis, what have we in order to do to achieve success? Why, to concentrate our energies upon this desirable object, that our means harmonize with the moral government of God, that our plans harmonize with his wisdom, that our plans harmonize with the perceptive economy of providence, and what becomes of the impossibility it is not. Thank you.